You know, hope, hope is a blinding light in the midst of our despair and darkness. Hope is what we look to when things seem to be falling apart. Hope is the light at the end of the tunnel. It's funny how a little light like this can give so much clarity, so much focus. Hope fills us with peace in the midst of a storm. Hope gives us rest in the midst of trials. Hope helps us in times of temptation. And hope gives us joy in life's most dire circumstances. Let me ask you a question this morning. What is your hope? Simple illustration, but it really brings it home. Amen? It really helps us think about hope and what our hope is in. You see, we all need hope. Without hope, we fall into despair. And the real, true, authentic believer in Jesus Christ has a true and eternal hope. Amen? That's the next thing that we see in this sermon series that you may know. A real believer, a true believer, as we're about to see, John says, is a believer who has an eternal and secure hope. A true and eternal hope. That is number six in your outline. That first blank right there is a true and eternal hope. One of the marks of eternal life. Now we want to get into this this morning. So if you're not already there, 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2 verses 28 and 29. And then 1 John chapter 3 crossing over into verses 1 through 3. We'll be reading this, but I want us to understand that there are really two aspects of the believer's hope. Two aspects. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there are two aspects to your hope. Number one is a hope promised. It is a hope promised. And we're going to take some time this morning before we get into the text to understand what our true hope is as believers in Jesus Christ. You see, the world has a lot of different false hopes. They have plans upon plans upon plans to give us hope for the future, right? We see that on the news from both political parties. They believe that their plans and their agendas will give us hope for the future. But for the believer, our hope is completely different. It is a hope that is promised. You remember when you were a little kid and your parents promised you something? How many of you, how many of you had that experience happen? Your parents promised you something that was just magnificent, something awesome. What was it? Give me an illustration. Give me something. What you got? Anybody Disney World? Was that? Anybody? You were promised Disney World. Did you go? Yeah. Hope fulfilled. Amen. Justin went to Disney World. And I bet as he thought about Disney World and dreamed about Disney World and contemplated what it would be like that first time he went to Disney World, he had a real hope about what Disney World would be like. Even as adults, we have hope. We have something we look forward to. But for the believer, we have a hope that surpasses anything superficial or temporal. See, the true believer's hope is promised in a threefold manner. The true believer anticipates and looks forward to these three things. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Number one, the promise of no more sin. The promise of no more sin. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings... How many of you have suffered in this life? Raise your hand. I consider that the present sufferings, and specifically he's speaking about persecution and, and the hardships that he and his fellow disciples have endured, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us for the creation that is all of creation. We think of creation, we think about the trees and the mountains and all those things. But the creation includes you and me. 
because we are created beings. The creation waits in eager expectation. It's like a little kid waiting to go to Disney World times a bazillion, right? The entire creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. What is he saying? One day, no more sin. One day, no more fighting that inner battle with the flesh. One day, the chains will be completely off and we will not have that war within us. Amen? That is a promise to the believer. Secondly is the promise of a new body. A new body. Romans 8.23. Romans 8.23 speaks about a new body. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan. We groan and we long for inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our what? It doesn't say souls or spirits or spiritual senses or mentality or mind. It says our bodies. We are going to have a new and redeemed body. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 speaks about this a little bit more clearly. But our citizenship is in heaven. Did you know you're a citizen of heaven if you're in Jesus Christ? Amen? And we eagerly wait. That phrase is repeated in a lot of scriptures we'll hear this morning. We eagerly wait. We're waiting like Christmas morning in your bed when you can get up and go downstairs and unwrap those gifts, those, pre- those pro- presents and those promises possibly. And we eagerly wait for the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Are you looking forward to that? Amen? See, the the timid response is a reflection of how we don't understand what's going to happen. The hushed amens and the, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Don't, it means we don't get it. I have family members who have passed. I have family members with mental impairments. Perhaps you know someone who has physical impairments. Perhaps you know someone who you spent your life caring for, whose physical body, I've seen this firsthand, whose physical body was destroyed. The mind, the body, the flesh, everything within, without, that, that we have, our, our, our earthly tent, as the Bible calls it, is going to be made perfect. Just like the body of Jesus is perfect. So maybe you had some ailments when you woke up this morning. Maybe you're having struggle submitting to the Lord and losing that weight. Maybe you know someone who who has a hard time with dexterity in their fingers. And their mind doesn't work quite, quite right. Did you ever think about that? Just like that, made perfect. The believer has a hope. No more sin. A brand new body. And thirdly and greatly, most greatly, the promise of being with and like Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 4 says this. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. 1 John 3, 2, our scripture this morning, just jumping ahead a little bit, says this, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't even know exactly what it's going to be like, but I'm looking forward to it. He says, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, this is our hope. This is our hope. No more sin, a new body, and to be like and to be with Jesus Christ. 
Now listen, the mark of a true believer in Jesus Christ, that's their hope. That's their focus. That's what their mind is set on. They might get a little bit bogged down in the concerns of this world. Things might take them aside once in a while. But ultimately, for the believer in Jesus Christ, their hope is not in a new car. You hear me? Their hope is not in a new home. Their hope is not in more money or a new job. Their hope, listen, listen, their hope is not in a child. Their hope is not in anything of this world. And I find myself thinking about these promises very often. You say, Dave, you're young, you shouldn't have that many problems. <laughs> We're all human. We all have suffering, we all have problems, we all have why questions, amen? As a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, we don't ignore those things, but we make sure that our focus is set in the present on what is to come in the future. No more sin, a new body, and forever with Christ and like Christ. As you go through trials, which many of you are, maybe you've just come out of a trial or you're about to go into a trial, remember that trials not only confirm your hope, they serve to strengthen your hope and to sharpen it. Just like this light when I lit it, when the area around you was dark and almost pitch black, it was that much brighter, the light was that much clearer and crisper and your focus was on the light for the believer in Jesus Christ if you want to know if you're a true true believer in Christ ask yourself is my hope focused on the promise of Christ and what he brings in eternity you see the unbelievers focus is in the things of the world how can I better my situation now it might even be some good things. How can I get involved in this way? How can I meet this need? Ultimately, for the believer, our hope is the promise of no more sin, the promise of a new body, and the promise of being with and like Jesus Christ. Amen? That is your spiritual Disney world. <laughs> you say, I'm not that excited about it. I don't know how that practically impacts my life. That is the attitude of an unbeliever, and you should take notice today. When a person believes this hope, it affects everything. Did you say everything? everything? Just like when you were a kid and you were promised something magnificent, it affected every area of your life. Maybe you started saving money for that trip you were promised, or that toy you were promised, or whatever it was you were promised. It changed your behavior. And as adults... When someone comes and, and they say, well, I'm going to visit you, and you love that person, and you haven't been with that person in a while, and you haven't spoken to that person, what do you do? What do we all do? We start to prepare, don't we? We start to get ready. We anticipate their coming. We get excited about their coming. We get excited about seeing their face and speaking to them again. We get excited to the point that we start to change our behaviors. We say, oh, man, I might need to lose a little weight before I see them again. Or, or maybe I need to clean the house before I see them again. Amen? Maybe I need to buy a new outfit before I see them again. We prepare. You see, the believer's hope is a hope that is promised, but it's also a hope that is prepared. Those are the two aspects of a believer's hope. And today, the majority of our time, we're going to look at the hope prepared. This is the evidence in your life. That your hope truly is what John says your hope should be. 1 John chapter 2, if you're there, say amen. We're going to look at what does hope prepared look like for the true believer. 1 John chapter 2, beginning of verse 28, he says, Now little children, that is a term for all the believers, abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practice righteousness is born of him. 
Verse number 1 of chapter 3, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask that you would be with us today. I pray that you would speak through me. Lord, we've set the foundation. We've set the goal. We've set set the promise before us. The believer's promise is no more sin. It's a new body. Lord, and it's being with you and like you. So we look to that this morning. I pray that every heart would be stilled, that distractions would cease, that we would take seriously the word of God, and Lord, that you would renew our hope in you and in your promise. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. A hope prepared, what does that look like? Number one, the true believer abides in Christ. If your hope is Christ and your hope is a new body and your hope is no more sin and your hope is being with him and that's your focus, it's going to play itself out in your life, okay? You're going to begin to prepare in a certain way. And the first thing that he says is the true believer abides in Christ. We see that very clearly in verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him, right? That's a very clear statement, Abide in him, and him is speaking of Christ. Now, abide here means to remain, to stay in, to remain in him. John 15, 4 is probably the verse that comes to your mind. This is one of the most famous verses in terms of abide. Jesus is speaking, and he says this, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. That word is repeated, and it's on purpose. Jesus is emphasizing that he wants them and wants you and me to remain in Christ, to abide in Christ. So what does that mean on a practical level? What does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, to abide in Christ means that I persevere daily in the gospel. Listen, are you listening? Say amen. I persevere in the gospel and in the Christ of the gospel. It means a passion and a pursuit for the commands of Christ. You can't abide in Christ without remaining in his word. Are you listening and say amen? Amen. It means the love of Christ is practiced in my everyday life. It means the word of Christ is a priority in my life, not just on Sundays. It means that I know the word and not only do I know it, but I strive to obey the word. It means I'm constantly In prayer with Christ. I'm constantly talking to him in my everyday situations. You say, Dave, people look at me like I'm crazy. You can do it silently. Amen? (laughs) You can speak to the Lord in your mind and in your heart and he will hear you. It means I am active and engaged as a part of the local church. It means I am constantly submitting my will to the will of Christ through the spirit of God. And it means this happens every moment of my life. Now you say, Dave, that's impossible. I'm not talking about perfection. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a checklist. I'm talking about abiding in Christ is an intimate relationship with Christ. Listen, listen, listen. That drives every single thing I do. Everything. From your driving to your grocery shopping, to your internet browsing, to the way you spend your money, to the way you spend your time. Do you hear the difference? One is out of law and obligation. Some of you are beat down because you're living by have-tos and and shouldn'ts and don'ts. And God wants to say, listen, I want a relationship with you that's vibrant and exciting, and I want you to remain, to abide in me. Abiding in Christ is an intimate relationship with Christ that drives everything I do. It's not do's and don'ts. When Christ says abide in me, he's saying have a relationship with me that influences your decisions. 
1 John 2, 19, this speaks about those who don't abide, right? We're talking about the marks of a true believer in Jesus Christ. So what does it mean? We all have that person, or maybe it's ourselves. And, and, and this person, maybe it's you. You don't do these things. Christ, it's not a relationship with you. It's a transaction. It, it's I got to do these things, or I got to go to church, or it's a tradition of my family, or I've been doing it this way for so long. It's a checklist that makes you feel good. That is not a mark of a true believer. What about those who don't abide? 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out. Why? So that it would be shown that they all are not of us. There are so many people that walk away from the faith and we think, what happened? The truth of the matter is, nothing happened Nothing happened. Nothing ever happened. Christ never was in their life. And it's revealed when they walk away from the faith, when they walk away from the church. I've seen people leave this church, and without judgment, I have to wonder, did they know Christ? What didn't they like? Didn't they, did they not like the gospel? Did they not like the preaching of the word? Did they not like the people of God? What didn't they like that caused them to leave? And, and listen, not find another church, never come back anywhere. That is a sign of a person who does not abide in Christ and does not know Christ. They went out from us because they were not of us. John MacArthur has this quote. I believe I put it in your notes. He says, no one who professes to believe the gospel but then permanently abandons the faith possesses eternal life. I would go a step further and say those who have made a profession of faith and never start coming to church, never start reading the word, never start praying, never start any of that. If there's no relationship there, they don't know Christ. The one who has truly placed their hope in Christ cannot, everybody say cannot. They cannot abandon Christ in profession, not just with the mouth. Because a lot of people walk away and they still say, well, I still believe in Jesus. I just, I just don't want anything to do with his church or with the Bible or with obeying him. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. The one who has truly placed their hope in Christ cannot abandon Christ in profession or in practice. Over and over and over, Christ talks about keeping his commands, doing what he has said to do, obeying him, not out of obligation, but out of love. Verse 28 again, the latter part, so that when he appears, we may have confidence. You see, Christ is returning. Amen? Christ is returning. Amen? Amen? So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. You see, when Christ appears, there's going to be a distinction. Those who truly know him will be ready because they will be abiding in Christ. Worshiping, praying, reading, fellowshipping, serving, loving Doing for Christ, not out of obligation, but out of love for Christ. They're going to be busy working for the king. And when the king comes back, they're going to say, praise God, hallelujah, about time. I'm ready to go. Let's get going. I'm ready. I'm ready to leave this place. God, take me now. Praise God. Thank God. Praise God. Praise God. There'll be excitement. And for the person who doesn't abide, oh, no. Oh no, what have I been doing? And it will separate those who truly have eternal life and those who do not have eternal life. The true believer will not shrink away at Christ's coming. The true believer will not be ashamed at Christ's return because the true believer lives, listen, preparing for Christ's return. They're not distracted with the things of the world. Secondly, the true believer manifests righteousness. Verse number 29, if you're still with me this morning, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Got to switch it up once in a while, right? If you're really with me, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Verse 29, listen to what he says. If you know that he is righteous, you know that. That everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. How many, how many people would say, that's confusing. What I just read is confusing. 
Come on, be honest. Okay, I'm the only one. Me and Greg. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate your honesty. Listen, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. It just sounds a little off. It sounds a little weird. Here's what you need to know about that verse. You need to know the word no. Everybody say no. K-N-O-W is really two different words here. Similar but different. The first no, he says, if you know, means to perceive. If you, if you see the truth, if you know the promise, no more sin, a new body, I get to be with Christ for all of eternity, and I get to be like him. If you know that, and then he says, he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. The second no means to know by, are you ready? Experience. Do you know or do you know in practice? That's what he's driving at. A true believer recognizes the truth that those who truly know the righteous God are verified as authentic by whether they practice righteousness themselves. You want to know if somebody's a believer? It's not just because they give a mental assent. Last week we talked about Jesus and, and, and Christology and who Christ is. That's important to know. But listen, somebody can know that Jesus is God. Somebody can know that Jesus is fully human. Somebody can know that Jesus is coming back. Right? Somebody can know all the right things and still not know by experience Christ. They're not prepared. They're not living it out. They're not manifesting righteousness. Because the person, what, what John is saying is the person that knows God more than a mental way... The person that truly experiences God and the redemption in Christ Jesus, they begin to live righteously because they know the righteous God. All who profess to be saved but do not demonstrate any tangible fruit of righteousness prove that they are actually unforgiven and have an empty hope. Such individuals can make no legitimate claim to eternal promises since their lives betray a heart that is still unregenerate. Here it is in a nutshell. This is not in your notes, but I suggest you write it to the side. No righteous living equals no hope. That's that simple. If you're not living Christ-like, if you're not attempting to live Christ-like, if you're not submitting to the Spirit and producing fruit, both fruit in sanctification, meaning you're changing, and also fruit in terms of good works, if that's not happening, you don't have eternal life and you have no hope real believers are not verified so much by what they claim as by how they live what a true statement real believers are not verified by how what they claim but by how they live that's what the bible says thirdly the true believer is astonished at god's love chapter 3 verse number 1 See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. The word see at the very beginning of this verse is both a command and an exclamation. He says it like this. See? Do you see? See how great... The Father's love is for his children. I'm commanding and at the same time I'm excited about it. Do you see how great the Father's love is? Now he says how great. This how great. There's no words. There's no precise parallel in the English language. There are literally no words to describe how great this love is. God loves believers with a love that is impossible to articulate in any human language and that is utterly foreign to normal human understanding and experience. You see, God's love is expressed in two ways to all of humanity. Are you a human? Raise your hand. If you're a human, God loves you. Did you know that? But it's different from the love that he has for believers. Did you know that? It's different. The first love for all of humanity is called common grace. God loves every single person and desires that they repent and turn to him. 
But for those who have repented and turned to him, he loves them with a special kind of love. You know what that special kind of love is called? You've heard it before. It's agape love. It's unconditional love. Now listen, to put it in practical terms, some of you are going to relate more than I could ever at this next principle. God loves you if you're in Christ more than you love your own children. God loves you because you are his child. And he loves you as a perfect father would love their child. It's a love that's incomprehensible to us. It's overwhelming. D. Edmund Herbert wrote this about these words. He said, the adjective rendered what manner or how great occurs only seven times in the New Testament. And it implies a reaction of astonishment. When's the last time you were astonished? What were you astonished at? Something bad probably, right? This is astonishment at the love of God. He says, and it usually also means admiration. Upon viewing some person or thing, the expression conveys both a qualitative and quantitative force. He says it like this, what glorious, measureless love. Here's my interpretation. Are you kidding me? That's how God loves me? It's a jaw drop, right? We've all done that. We've seen somebody, it's usually something bad or somebody does something real stupid and you're like, right? But, but the true believer, the person who has eternal life, the person who has true hope, the person that knows what Christ is going to do, what they're going to get, who they're going to be with for all of eternity, the person that understands and begins to even grasp just a little bit of God's love for them. It's astonishment. If you've never had that thought run through your mind, it's likely you're not a believer. That's what John's saying. Because the true believer is astonished at the love of God. If you flip over just one chapter to chapter 4 of 1 John, verses 9 through 10, listen to what he has done. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, it says, By this the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Last week we talked about propitiation and the basic meaning is payment. That God sent his one and only son to die on the cross to be the payment that we couldn't pay. That should make somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That should make us stop in an amazement and astonishment. Think about the love of God. Ephesians 3, 17 and 19 is on the screen. It's a little small. Listen to what he says. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. In what love? In God's love. The love that sent his only son for us may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. And this is what Paul wants the believer and wants you to grasp. To grasp how wide and how long how high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge do you get it do you feel do you understand the love of God for you some of you struggle with sin I don't care what sin it is pride, pornography Any sin, I, I could keep going, any sin. Do you know what's going to conquer that sin? It's the love of God. The love of God for you. We have victory and freedom in Christ, knowing what he has done for us. And we stop and we stare and we wonder, when's the last time you or I stopped and wondered at the grand love of God for us? Why would he do such a thing for you and for me? That's the heart attitude of a true believer. It's the mark of one who truly knows Christ. This person recognizes and rejoices in astonishment and wonder at God's undeserved, unconditional, unexplained love. Listen, not in general, but to you. That's how God loves you. If you were the only person on the face of the earth, he would have died for you. Does the love of God astonish you? 
If you've never weeped in wonder at the unrelenting love of God for you, perhaps you don't know the God of love. The true believer is astonished at God's love for them. Number four, the true believer longs, longs to be like Jesus and to be with Jesus. Longs, there is the word I'm using for, it's a passion. It's not just a hobby. It's not just a good idea. You desire it. You crave it. You want it. You seek it. You can't wait for it. You eagerly wait, like the scriptures say. You can't wait to that day when Christ comes back in all his glory. And he brings us back with him. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're made like Jesus Christ. And we're going to be with him forever. That is the heart of a person who truly knows God. John MacArthur says, heaven is attractive for believers because there they will not only see the Lord Jesus Christ, but will become like him. I just referenced this scripture. Let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 53. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly. He says, just like we have the image of our earthly bodies, we will also bear the image of the heavenly Now I say this, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Next verse. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. Imperishable. Let's just stop there for a moment. No more disease, no more sickness, no more death will be raised imperishable, and we will be, what? Changed. We can't even understand. We can't even fathom. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's what the believer has to look forward to. That's what the believer longs for, to be like Jesus. Now listen, here's where the transition happens. Okay? This is the promise You will be like Christ. If you are in Christ, if you have trusted in Christ, if your salvation is solely in Christ, you're not not relying on your own works to get into heaven. You've put your faith and trust in what Christ did, in Christ himself. If that is you, then you will begin to prepare to meet Christ again now. It's not something that you just hope for and look for and anticipate It's not just, oh man, I can't wait till that day. No, it moves you and I to action, to preparedness. You see, the true believer wants that day, and they begin to prepare for that day now. Why? Because the true believer knows Christ's likeness brings intimacy with Christ, and perfect Christ's likeness will bring perfect intimacy with Christ. Do you see it? Do you hear it? Do you fathom the concept? The true believer enjoys talking to Jesus. Sometimes it's hard, yes. Sometimes we have to be disciplined, yes. Sometimes we don't feel like praying. But ultimately we enjoy the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. We enjoy hearing the word of God. Reading the word of God. Changing in in the likeness of Christ by way of the word of God. The true believer prepares in that way, prepares in the way that they are sanctified, sanctified, sanctified. That is made more like Jesus right here, right now. The unbeliever says this, oh, I can't wait for Jesus to come back and I don't have to sin no more and I get a new body and that'll be cool. They stop short of what truly is great and majestic and awesome about heaven. And that is Jesus Christ himself and that we will be like Christ himself. And it shows up here in this world. I want you to repeat this phrase. Sin kills intimacy. Let's try it again. Sin kills intimacy. Do you know that? If you're in sin, there's a reason you feel distant from God. It's because of your sin. And that sin will also affect your relationships with other people. You feel distant from your spouse. You feel distant from a friend. You feel distant from church people. It likely has to do with sin in your life. Not always, but nine times out of ten, sin is the culprit. Because sin kills intimacy. 
The more unholy, the more unloving, the more unlike Jesus we are, the more miserable, listen, the more miserable the true believer will become. You can't stand it. Why am I so depressed? Why am I in despair? Listen, I'm not saying this is always the reason, but it's a reason that I found in my life often. But the more Christ-like the believer becomes, the more joy, the more peace, and the more love that that person has. That's why the true believer not only longs to be like Jesus on that day, she longs to be like Jesus on this day. So many people say, well, if I'm going to be like Jesus in heaven, why don't I just do what I want to do right now? That is an ungodly and unregenerate answer. And it shows the person doesn't know Christ. Because when you know Christ and you begin to love Christ and you begin to grow in that relationship, you know how much joy and peace and love he brings. And you want more of that. Now think about that perfected. That's what you and I have to look forward to in heaven. Those who truly know Jesus want to be like Jesus because they know that in becoming more like Jesus, they will experience more deeply the peace of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, the majesty of Jesus, the glory of Jesus, and the love of Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Here's the application as we close. Mostly, today, so that you actually become more like Jesus, you need to evaluate your hope. There are two areas that you're in. There are two different groups here this morning, and only two. Group number one is the group whose hope is in something other than Jesus Christ and his return and all that comes with it. And they're a true believer but they're a little distracted. That happens to us, doesn't it? Because we're human and we have the flesh. And you've placed your hope in a person, in a child, in a thing, in a possession, in a plan, in money, in whatever else. And you wonder why you're becoming despondent and depressed and and, and there's no joy and peace and love in your life. It's because as a believer in Jesus Christ, you only receive those things when your hope is properly fixed on Christ. You need to repent Put your hope back where it should be. And then there's the group over here. The group who think they have hope in Christ. But they don't care about anything here that regards him. They don't care to prepare for there. (laughs) Amen? If that's you, you need to stop fooling yourself. You need to repent. Come to Christ because of Christ. Not because of anything he gives you. Because you see his glory, majesty, and love. And you fall down at his feet and tell him to take over your life. To take over everything that's in you. And to become your hope.